Welcome. We're back to another hot edition of Free College. It is 95 degrees outside. And my intern, Princey, has to go back to Xavier University. Soon. I could have just been like, I'm going back to school soon, guys. Wish me luck. But you just want to throw it all out, all out there. You got to go back to school. August 22nd. And get an education. Get my education. That you pay for. But here on Free College, you get a free education. Because education, not preparation for life. Education is life itself. And we got a great show prepared for you today. If you're paying attention to education, you probably heard something over the airwaves uh, uh, last week. Uh, last week, the Black Lives Matter Collective, representing approximately 50 organizations, released an official platform titled A Vision for Black Lives. Its education section called for an end to the privatization of education and petition for more community control of schools. Essentially, they asked for a banning of charter schools or a curbing of charter schools. A list of demands included a moratorium on charter schools and school closures. The NAACP at their national conference also took a stand against charters by approving a resolution that calls for a moratorium on the expansion of privately managed charters, this is their words, it has yet to be approved by the national board. Um, so we've got a very interesting um, show for you. If you think um, we should halt the expansion of charter schools, give us a call. In, in New Orleans, do you think we should move back to a more traditional neighborhood school model? Um, do you agree with Black Lives Matter and the NAACP for taking a stand on charter schools? And do you believe charter schools have proven themselves and deserve a place in the educational landscape. You can call in at 504-260-9265. That's 504-260-9265. To help me, I have two very special guests. Um, I have two nationally noted scholars in the house. I have Julian Vasquez-Helig, a professor of educational leadership and policy studies and director of the doctorate in educational leadership at Sacramento State. And I also believe he had a little to do with the drafting of the NAACP resolution. Hi, Dr. Julian. How are you? It's good. It's good. It's a good day. It's Very beautiful good. here also in California. Uh, glad to talk with you, Andre. Very good. I also have um, someone you probably see a lot Hanging out in the streets of New Orleans is Dr. Howard Fuller, Distinguished Professor of Education and Director of the Institute of the Transformation of Learning. How you doing, Dr. Dr. Hey, Fuller? Hey, I'm good. Very good. I'm going to go ahead and just call you by your, your first name. Is that okay? <laughs> These guys are my visiting professors, but I, I would consider them um, friends and colleagues nonetheless. So I'm going to go ahead and call them by their first name, Julian and Howard. And you can reach them at... I'm Professor JVH on Twitter or at Howard L. Fuller. Um, that's two L's um, on Twitter. And of course, you can always join me at Andre Perry EDU. I want to start with you, Julian. Um, can you just give us a little context of what happened um, at the national convening and and just give a little bit of, of, of our listeners a sense of who drafted the, resol uh, the resolution, and a little bit of its history. Great, yeah. So I, I think there's also some other context, which is that you know, the NAACP has, I think, evolved on this issue over time. Uh, there was a 2010 resolution that basically said that you know, charter schools should not be the vanguard education policy and that we should be really focused on funding uh, traditional public schools in the way they should be. You know, Louisiana, for example, is one of the bottom spending states in, in, in the U.S. in terms of per pupil spending. In 2014, I think the language got a little stronger, uh, the 2014 resolution. And in that resolution, basically, they talked about the role that charter schools are playing in the privatization and private control of our schools. Um, and as you know, over the past five to six years, and as you're well aware in New Orleans over the last ten years or so, is that charter schools are rising in prominence. Hundreds of millions of dollars are being pumped into charter schools. 
And so, uh, you, uh, but without, with a, with a lack of accountability. And so I think the challenge has been, uh, how is it that we can pump the brakes, take stock? And so the delegates, more than 2,200 black folks from across the United States, that we need to stop, we need to take stock on what's happening uh, with charter schools nationally. So how, how did the resolution come about? So the resolution uh, came out of uh, the San Jose chapter. It then goes to uh, the state. Then from the state, it goes to a national resolutions committee. Then after the resolutions committee, it goes to the vote of all of the delegates from across the United States in the organization. Of course, we know that the NAACP has been a vanguard of civil rights for more than 100 years, so the delegates voted on it. And then the final step is that the national board will vote on it in, its, in their meeting in the fall. In the fall. And, um, and so there's a, been a, a somewhat of a, a pushback against this because uh, many people have talked about the benefits of charter schools, um, not only here in Louisiana, but um, nationally. Um, Dr. Fuller Howard, um, when you saw this um, resolution on the Internet or wherever you got a hold of it, um, what was your initial reaction? Well, my initial reaction was um, to try to really understand the the thinking that was behind it because I happen to be a black person who believes that black people can disagree without having to try to demonize each other or engage in demagoguery. And so my position is that um, what the NAACP is talking about, I do not agree with. I don't think we should put the brake on charter schools, but I don't think that charter schools are a panacea any more than I think the traditional school district is. So my perspective is, how is it that we use these various options to try to make sure that our kids get educated? I happen to be a person who also supports traditional school districts, and I do agree we want in the sense that we should be trying to fight to make sure that all of our children are fully funded. And I think the problem is that we're forced into these false choices that you have to choose between charter schools and traditional public schools or private schools. And my view is that these three sectors ought to all be available uh, to our to our children, particularly uh, children from low income and working class. Three meaning um, charters, traditional, and, and private. private. Right, yeah. right. Now, um, Julian, um, can you just um, respond to that? In sure. Um, you know, what about charters in particular? Um, well, well, you know what I th- what I think is uh, I think is important is that two of those options that uh, that the professor talked about are privately controlled options, whether it be private schools or charter schools, because what a lot of people don't realize with charter schools is that the boards of those schools are selected, they're appointed, they're not democratically accountable, and so when it says in the resolution privately managed, what that means is that charter boards that are not democratically elected are privately controlled, controlled sometimes by corporations. Uh, in Michigan, the vast majority of charter schools are, are for profit. Uh, we know, for example, in, in New Orleans, almost all the schools in the recovery district are now charter schools, if not all of them. Uh, and so those are all private options. And so what, is that, what does private control actually mean? Uh, Steve Perry said, well, churches are private and the Urban League is private. What private means is there's no democratic accountability for uh, whatever decisions that they make in terms of funding so for, or, or admissions policies. So, for example, in California, the ACLU released a report last Monday showing that of the charter schools that made their policies available online, and, that, and so we're just talking about charter schools that had their policies online. More than 20% of them had policies where the schools actually did the choosing. And as parents in New Orleans know, they've got to put their kids often on buses to go all the way across town in the morning because their neighborhood public schools have been shut down. Uh, and and, 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 what, and, and I, so I think that that is the question we have to ask ourselves. Is, do, we, do we want corporations? Do we want private entities? controlling public dollars without any accountability. With it. These are anti-democratic policies. Yeah, but, but my response to that is having been the, the chair of the board of a charter school now for 10 years, uh, number one, we are directly responsible to our authorizer. Our authorizer is the city council of Milwaukee that is elected, and these elected representatives review everything that we do every single year. They have the ability to close the school if it doesn't work. They're the ones who determine whether or not our school can operate. And so the, 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 the problem I have 
with the way that this is being characterized is it is if all charter schools are, quote, managed by private corporations. Some are, but the vast majority of them actually are not. And so when people start talking about democratically controlled, my question always is, at what level of democracy are you talking about? Because I believe that we are democratically controlled. We could not exist were it not for the authorizing body that reports directly to the city council of Milwaukee. And so I, I guess, you know, I don't understand how you would characterize that as not being uh, publicly controlled. Well, that's a great question. So what we're actually talking about is direct versus indirect democracy. So here in California, here's how the authorization process happens. It's kind of like when you go, you go to your mom and you ask her for candy and she says no. Then you go to your father and you ask him for candy and he says no. So then you actually go next door to your neighbor and you ask him for candy and he says yes. So here you ask your district, then you ask your county. And when, and when charter schools like Rocket Ship got shut down, they went to the state board, which is appointed, and that's indirect democracy. And so what you're talking about is a board that was appointed by Milwaukee, which is indirect democracy. But with school boards, you have direct democratic control. And that's exactly what's happened in Chicago, for example. The mayor now appoints the school board, which is indirect democracy. Right? And so that's what we're talking We're talking about direct democracy, not indirect democracy. And, and what I would say ultimately is, and, and I appreciate, uh, you know, this conversation. I hope we actually can meet sometime. I would like to meet you and talk with you. But what I would argue is ultimately for me the issue is what is it that's absolutely happening to children when it comes to being educated? Because the reality of it is I was the superintendent of what you would call a direct democratically controlled entity. And that direct democratically controlled entity was failing to educate large numbers of poor black children. And so for me, ultimately, the issue becomes what is it that we can do to make sure that our children get educated? Because as you know, June, if we don't educate these kids, there is another direct democratically controlled entity waiting for them called prisons. And so while we may not agree on the particular mechanisms to try to make this happen, I think we probably agree, I'm not sure, but I think we probably agree that the goal really is to try to make sure that our children are educated so that they actually can participate in the transformation of their world, as Paulo Freire talks about it. But, so, no, I think, go ahead. so I think it's interesting you talked about prisons, which is actually is an example of privatization, which is that you now have prison companies that are privatized, which go to legislatures to lobby, to in, and we, we know this is the case, to lobby legislators to make sure that those prison beds are full. And so this is actually a critique of private, private, private prisons, is actually a critique of privatization. So I, I, think, I think that's an important to say. What we do agree, I think, is that clearly our society has decided that on the other side of the tracks that those kids are going to receive a lesser education. For example, the Supreme Court in Texas just decided that it was okay to have a $25,000 difference between rich and poor schools per classroom. Now, that's per classroom. So if you aggregate that to the school level, we're talking about hundreds of thousands of dollars between rich and poor. If you add that to the uh, district level, that's millions of dollars, the difference between rich and poor. And see, that's what's really going on here, which is that we have created a market. So you know that when you buy a house, the nicer house you buy, the nicer public school that you get. And so with markets, there are winners and losers. And so what we know about markets from the research, and, and I'm sure Dr. Fuller is aware of the peer-reviewed research on, on how markets function, especially how they function in Chile, is that uh, the, you have capital in a market. And so uh, kids that don't have capital to spend, so for example, New Orleans, if you can't drive your kid all the way across town to that charter school, et cetera, et cetera, then they have to get on the bus. Or you have to have information capital. You have to have financial capital. When we're talking about vouchers, for example, all of this capital has to be spent in a market. That's what a market is. And markets have winners and losers. And as we know from uh, the New Orleans case, the vast majority of, school, of charter schools in the recovery school district are C, D, and F. The vast majority of them. And that's after 10 years. Now we're often talking about how this is a model system. But the recovery school district is last and nearly last in almost every single education outcome in the state. And so the idea that somehow charter schools, and then we, we talk about the Credo study, and maybe we could talk about some of the research studies if we want, but, but let me just pass the mic back to you all. Yeah, I, I would say, Jim, that you, you threw around a lot of very important concepts. I'm not so sure how they all connected. And let's be really clear, I, I am not a person who, who supports 
privatization of prisons. I don't support the prison complex, either private or public, the way that it's operated. I think you and I would just have to agree that we can't just point to the privatization of prisons as the problem that's facing black people, because even before the prisons were privatized, as you're calling, we had problems. The issue that I don't agree with you on is the terminology of what is it that makes something private. I don't see that, for example, the charter school that I'm the chair of the board of, that that is a private entity. That is a public entity that is controlled and authorized by a publicly elected entity. So we may have some disagreements, you know, even on terms. The other thing I would say to you is that when I was the superintendent of Milwaukee Public Schools, we bus 65,000 kids a day. And you know why? Because in our democratically controlled school board, they had made a decision to integrate the Milwaukee Public Schools, and they put the integration for those schools on the back of black children. So every single day, kids got on buses to go hundreds of blocks from their schools to promote desegregation. So let's not act as if charter schools have somehow created this whole notion of busing. The busing that we've been talking about or that I've been fighting most of my life was the result of decisions made by the democratically controlled, the direct democratically controlled school board that you seem to be enamored with. Now, Julie, I want to get to this issue of community control, which is somewhat related to democratically elected entities. Black Lives Matter issued their their platform, and one of the planks of that platform was community control. Um, they call for direct and uh, democratic community control of local, state, and federal law enforcement agencies, um, so on and so forth. I, is there a way, Julian, in your mind that a community can have control through a charter school? Sure. sure. I, th- I think that, um, you know, uh, in-district charters make sense. There's also intra-governmental charters. I sh- you know, I should say that I was on the board of a charter school. Um, I was an instructor at a charter school. I had a child at a charter school. I've been a donor to a charter school. But I think it's okay for us to change our minds. I think it's okay for society to change their minds on the direction of charter schools. Uh, I think one of the interesting things that we haven't talked about is essentially what's happening is we're using public tax dollars to create a secondary system. And uh, so where does this all go? I think I think that's an important question that, that we're not really asking. What is charter schools look like and in, in, what do they look like in 10 years. So one of the interesting things comes from uh, Puerto Rico. And Wall Street, of course, uh, was on the hook for a lot of debt in, in Puerto Rico. And so they were really influential in the conversations about charter schools in, in Puerto Rico. And so it was interesting what they did in Puerto Rico is they said, okay, we've created this secondary system. They call them leader schools, L-I-D-E-R. And what we're going to do is, is in the legislation, we're going to say, well, these leader schools, they've been charter schools that have been public, but now what we're going to do is we're going to make these schools private schools. And now all the teachers that teach in them, they're now private employees, and they're no longer part of the pension system, et cetera. And so we have to think about if we use private uh, public tax dollars to create a secondary system, we pay for the buildings, we pay for the leasing, we pay for all of these things. Like, for example, with the uh, the Gulen-affiliated charters, whether they be Concept in the middle Midwest or the Harmony or the Magnolia in California, we've given them $500 million. This is the second largest charter chain. And where is that money going? There's, the FBI has, has, has um, raided their schools in four states, and so this money is being privately controlled. And so the question is, in the future, Will we see politicians say, well, you know, we don't really believe in direct democratic control of schools, and, and in legislation say all of these charter schools that the public dollars have paid for, they are now private schools, privately controlled. And I think the other thing I think is important to say is Preston Green, who is a uh, law and education scholar at, at Connecticut, has actually uh, written a lot about what the courts say about whether charter schools are public or private. And so the thing is, is that when charter schools go into court, they actually say they're private entities. So when it comes to due process, when it comes to availability of data, et cetera, et cetera, charter schools are not arguing in court that they're public schools. They're actually arguing that they're private entities. Now, okay. Yeah, I, I'm aware of that, but the, but the fact is, Julie, not all charter schools are making that argument because there are those of us out here who support charter schools who believe very clearly 
that as public schools, we should be totally transparent in terms of where resources go, in terms of test scores, et cetera. So just as I'm not sure that there's common agreement within the totality of, of BLM, let's say, which I totally support, by the way, I would argue that you don't have that kind of un, un, unanimity in, within the charter school movement itself, that there, there, there are people in this movement who have a very different view than certain other people who are in this movement because it, 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 it isn't a, a, a monolith in terms of how we see this and how it is that we see trying to move forward. And I totally agree with you that as we move into the future, every public policy ought to be constantly evaluated and reevaluated in terms of its impact, in terms of what it is actually doing, is it really helping our people or not helping our people. And so I totally agree with you on that. I don't, I don't think anything, charter schools, anything else, ought to just have a free pass without constantly being evaluated in terms of what is actually happening and, 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 and how how tax dollars are being used. Well, but, 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 I think there's a. I think I think this is an important distinction that we that we need to make, which is that just like private prisons lobby in state capitals, charter school associations do that too. In fact, in California, we have a bill um, 322, uh, Senate Bill 322, and I was asked to testify on that bill last last year. And the charter school association um, uh, brought in on buses a hundred parents, mostly Latino. About half of them only spoke Spanish. And they basically said that this bill would cause charter schools to close. Now, what was, what was this bill actually about? This bill was about keeping track of teacher attrition out of charter school and keeping, keeping track of disciplinary data. So even if some charter schools don't feel like that they're a part of a broader movement of private control and privatization of it, even if they don't feel that way, they have lobbyists in state capitals saying that we shouldn't know what the teacher attrition is in charter schools across this state. We shouldn't know what the school discipline is. And the Civil Rights Project has clearly shown that charter schools have higher rates of discipline and they're more likely to suspend black and Latino boys than traditional public schools. The Civil Rights Project um, a study that came out maybe a month or two ago. And so even if some charter schools don't feel like they're a part of this broader movement, they are protected by the charter school lobbying associations, just like all the other charter schools that could be considered bad apples. When I was superintendent, I paid a lobbyist to be up in the state capitol every single day to lobby for what it was that we wanted for our school district. The school boards association have a lobbyist. The unions have a lobbyist. So come on, man. Don't, don't talk like charter schools invented lobbyists. Everybody who's trying to get something done for whatever it is they do, they pay lobbyists to be up in state government. That's what they do. You know that, and I know that. Yeah, but and, no, 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 we're, no, 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 no. What we're talking about here is accountability, though. Right? No, no, no. But, but account, okay, let's talk about accountability. Because to me, accountability is based on do you have a requirement that you have to meet certain benchmarks? What are those requirements? Who establishes those requirements? And who ultimately makes the decisions as to whether or not you are being held accountable? And I would argue that charter schools in this country are, in fact, held accountable by publicly elected bodies. Now, you may not like the makeup of boards. I don't like the makeup of certain democratically elected boards. But the, but the issue is... Can we hold people accountable by setting benchmarks, by having regular meetings to make sure that those benchmarks are being met? And if that is happening, I would call that accountability. And I, and, 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 and I would say that you have as much accountability, in fact, in the charter sector, in, in, in some ways, more accountability than you have in the traditional system because historically we have not held schools accountable in the traditional system. That is why people like me fought for charter schools in the first place. So, so I, did, I did my homework, and I watched a few of your comments, and one of the things you said when you were in North Carolina was that charter schools would receive, receive freedom in exchange for accountability. Yes. Now, here's, here's the challenges, right? So in many states, uh, charter schools are exempt from a lot of the code. So, for example, in California, you only have to have teachers who are trained and or certified in core subjects. But if you teach PE or anything else auxiliary, you can hire somebody off the street. Right? We don't, we're not able to keep track of discipline data. We're not able to keep track of teacher attrition because they aren't, they are not required to keep that data. So to me, not knowing what's going on with those issues is the opposite of accountability. Right, right? but, I, but, 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 every, but every, every single year, every single year at my charter school, we have to show the elected school, the, the elected city council, here's our attrition data, 
Here's all of our teachers have to be licensed. We have to provide that information every single year. In fact, we provide more information, I would argue, than the traditional system ever provided when I was a superintendent. So I don't think, I don't think you can just make these comments as if this is something that exists throughout the whole uh, 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 system of charters because it's, it's not true. So I, so I think this is I think this is actually where 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 we see an evolution, right? So the NWCP in their resolution calls for a moratorium to take stock, and I think this is a this and I think um, uh, Dr. Fuller is is right on the money in saying that state to state the rules that charter schools have to follow are quite different. In fact, in Minnesota, there is some democratic accountability uh, for for boards there. Of course, is where. Charter schools were born, but the the, the rules and the uh, the legislation varies quite dramatically from state to state. And so I think the next evolution in this conversation is thinking about how we put together uh, more accountability. So if I take uh, Dr. Full on his word and he produces all this data for his authorizing his appointed authorizing board. That sounds great. But that's not the requirement in every state. In Texas, that's not the requirement. In California, that's not the requirement. And so I think the next step, and I have no say in this, of course, but I think I would love to see the NAACP in the next year have a resolution that details the different places by which charters should be held more accountable. Are you going to say the same thing for the traditional districts? Because you and I both know that there is no uniform system of accountability in this country state by, uh, uh, for states. Each, each, each state has the authority and the power to create its own accountability system to include, include its own measurements. And so just as you're saying this exists for charter schools, this also exists for the traditional school systems. Right, right, right. But I just finished saying that in the, in the various states, that the charter schools are given freedom in exchange for accountability, which, in, which means that they're exempted, exempted from large parts of the education code in many states where traditional schools are not exempted from that code. But, but see, I would argue, and I've argued for years, and I argued it when I was a superintendent, that, that I wanted my traditional school district to be exempt from some of those codes because some of those things are things that are not necessary, and in fact, they don't help us educate kids. That's the, I, I talked so little that break. I've never spoken that that little in my entire radio career. We're gonna come back. <laughs> We're gonna come back in a Julia, minute. We need to take over. <laughs> no, they already have. We'll be back after the break. Hi, this is Norman Robinson. New Orleans East Hospital is open and providing quality health care in your neighborhood. The New Orleans East Hospital is bringing our finest physicians into a beautiful new facility where you receive compassionate caring service. Emergency room services at New Orleans East Hospital are some of the best in the region. To learn more, visit our website at noehospital.org. Your health matters to us at New Orleans East Hospital. With more than 30 years of experience and dedication servicing New Orleans and Baton Rouge, Richard's Disposal provides dependable, non-hazardous solid waste collection and disposal services to residential, commercial, and industrial customers. We also provide recycling and portable toilets. At Richard's Disposal, we are known for our expertise and we're dedicated to our customers, all while utilizing the most advanced, environmentally friendly, and cost-effective methods possible. We strive to provide the latest solutions and technology to get the job done. At Richard's Disposal, we appreciate our customers one pickup at a time. Call us today at 504-241-2142. Richard's Disposal, community-focused, environmentally friendly. Nunez Community College offers training in industrial crafts and skilled trades. Skilled craft workers are always in demand. Nunez Community College offers training in electrical, millwright, pipe fitting, solar construction, and welding. Get the in-demand trade skills required for success in today's economy at Nunez Community College. Credit and non-credit options are available. Nunez is enrolling students now for the fall 2016 semester. Regular fall classes begin on Monday 
8th, August 22nd. Skilled crafts courses are offered based on student demand, allowing flexible scheduling to meet your needs. Nunez is conveniently located at 3710 Paris Road in Chalmette, just minutes from downtown New Orleans and easily accessible from New Orleans East or the West Bank. Start your career in a skilled trade like electrical, construction, HVAC, or welding with Nunez Community College. Call 504-278-6420 or visit www.nunez.edu. Nunez Community College, changing minds. Looking for that perfect gift for a birthday, an anniversary, or how about just to brighten someone's day? Mona's Accents is your one-stop shop for beautiful floral arrangements that are indeed perfect for any special occasion. Dedicated to quality, freshness, and customer satisfaction, Mona's Accents will surely take care of all of your floral needs. So stop by the shop located at 2109 North Claiborne Avenue or call us at 504-944-7001 and let us arrange and deliver your floral gifts. Again, that's 504 504- 944-7001 or you can order online at www.monasaccents.com Mona's Accents Freshness, quality and customer satisfaction guaranteed WBOK 1230 AM The People's Station My theme music, I'm going to start playing that every time I'm on a speaking engagement. I'm just going to stroll on the stage. Ain't that right, Princey? Like it's your song, your your own song, your personal song. It, like it's my personal song. You know song. Dr. Perry's coming when you hear it. Exactly. That's going to just perceive me every time I have an engagement. <laughs> so we're back. We're talking the Black Lives Matter as well as the NAACP platforms that shun charter uh, charter schools and ed, ed reform in general. Um, with me, we have Julian vasquez Helic, Professor of Educational Leadership and Policy Studies at Sacramento State. And we have Dr. Howard Fuller, Distinguished Professor of Education and Director of the Institute for the Transformation of Learning. We've, we just ended a, uh, a robust segment ending with, the issue of community control. But I'm going to throw this out there because this is where I come in and I'm very passionate about. The reason why I got into charter schools, many of you know this, that I ran four charter schools um, prior uh, um, after Katrina um, through the University of New Orleans. I got involved because I thought it was the most direct way to get power for black communities. Because for me particularly at the time, the idea that 80 schools and 120 schools in New Orleans could be managed by seven people, five, five people, nine people, wherever you are, was pretty ridiculous. Because particularly when you run for schools and a window breaks, you know how difficult it is to, to get through that bureaucracy just to um, get to the window. But I also saw that it was an opportunity to hire local to um, provide a curriculum that um, resonated with local interests. It was an opportunity to do unique programming. Um, so I got involved in, in it for power reasons because I generally believe that we're not here to improve um, test scores. We're here to improve a community. And schools are one mechanism out of many to get there. Um, so I'm going to throw this out to both of you. Um, from a power perspective, um, what is wrong with charter schools in that regard? And I'm going to um, start with you, Dr. Fuller, um, because I know that this is an area that you've been um, critical on all sides in terms of making sure that power is a, is a, a pillar in the education reform movement. Yeah, I mean, I and, and you know this. I mean, I'm I'm arguing, and I will continue to argue today, tomorrow, next week, that we have far too few black people 
who uh, are able to develop charter management organizations, who are able to develop schools that that black people control or that are led by black people. And that's very, very important to me. And so one of the things I'm, I, I'm just pleased with is, you know, you, you look at some of the the, the organizations that exist out there. I mean, I, I don't know if uh, Julian knows about Margaret Fortune and the work that she's doing out in California with her schools. Um, you got uh, Derwin, the brother in uh, Memphis, who is is running tremendous schools. And now schools. Tulsa. I'm, I'm yeah, and now he's going he's gonna to think move to, to Oklahoma. So there, there, there are a number of really great, uh, systems of schools or, or organizations of schools that are being operated by black people, but not nearly enough. And so my argument has been that we don't have enough black-led entities that are operating in our communities to serve our communities and, and, and have that power that institutional development and institutional control actually means. Julian, you want to respond to that? You know, I was I was talking with a dean of a, a college of education recently uh, about this very issue. You know, I think it's important for uh, for uh, for African Americans, for Black folks, Latinos, Asian Americans to have schools that uh, that they lead. Um, there's no doubt about it. But I, I think one of the things we also need to talk about is where the money comes from for charter schools. The money for the property, the money for the bonds. Uh, and the thing is, is that there's a lot of money tied up in charters, and unfortunately, the financiers of these charter schools are often white folks. Uh, and so the, what happens is these brown and black faces become beho- beholden to the folks that are working behind the scenes, spending the bonds and all these other things. And so, you know, I, I completely believe that, that, that we need to have leaders of color uh, in education. There's no doubt about it. But I also think we need to realize that behind the scenes, that where this money comes from and who people are beholden to is also uh, something we need. Isn't to that say. same money in the traditional it, public it, school system? It, yeah, that's my point. Sure, sure it is. But so, for example, <laughs> bonds on charter schools are considered often considered risky. And so what happens is, is Wall Street gets double and triple the returns on charter schools. So, of course, they think it's a great idea. Another example of this is where people who are running charter schools start, then start a leasing uh, organization. They sell the school to their leasing organization, and then they charge themselves rent from the corporation that they started, right? So there's all these financial shenanigans that happens with charter schools. And I understand the conversations about parent choice and these sorts of things, but this is where the accountability piece comes in, is that there's a whole financial side to charter schools that the public is just not very aware of. And, and, and I would say to you, Julian, that, that I'm, I'm with you, that any time I see those kind of arrangements being made for charters or anything else, i got serious problems with that. But what I will tell you is that some of the shenanigans that go on in traditional public school systems and who's making money in traditional public school systems, it ain't a lot of black and Latino people who are making big money off of traditional public school systems because you know that there's a whole bunch of deals that go down in traditional systems around buildings and bonding and all that. So don't act like charter schools got some kind of corner so, on that kind so, of stuff. Well, this is, a, this is an argument that actually uh, is used for school discipline. It's used for finance. It's used for it's all of, so the thing is, is that if we're going to spend hundreds of millions of dollars on charter schools, then our standard should be higher. It shouldn't be the same. It shouldn't be less. So every time you bring up a critique of charter schools, the response is typically, well, traditional public schools do that too. But if we're going to spend hundreds of millions of dollars on charter schools, our standard must be higher. And I would argue that our standards ought to be higher for both because we're spending hundreds of millions of dollars on traditional public schools that don't educate our children, man. And so we shouldn't sit here and act like these traditional public school systems are some kind of panacea for our children and charter schools are this horrible thing that exists. I would work with you or anybody else to deal with real issues in the charter sector that are not right or that are, 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 are in any way like not operating in the interests of our children. But, but I'm not going to sit here and, 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 and say that I'm going to put those kind of high standards on charter schools, but I'm not going to have it for any other sector that serves our children. Now, but I still want to get to this notion of power building. And there's um, something in me that this um, feels, and it comes to my experience, when you actually have control of your own schools, that you are personally responsible. 
yeah. that it builds a capacity that you could not. And that's why I think, I mean, and this is another reason why I think it is um, important for universities to actually, it may not be a charter, but it should be um, a lab school, um, some type of school that they're affiliated yeah. with, because then you could exercise student um, um, student teachers and actually have faculty embedded in the school so they could um, build muscle, if you will, um, to be better instructors um, to their student um, to their student teachers. So I think I, you know, I, I probably didn't answer your question about community-based approaches as well as I, I could have earlier. And so let, let me loop back to that, which is that so with KIPP or the Gulen schools that like to put science or technology in the title of every single school that they have all across the United States, these schools are externally controlled. They're not controlled by people from those communities. They're, for example, in the Gulen's case, they get all these visas and bring teachers in from. Turkey who don't speak much English, et cetera, et cetera, right? And so you you have a lot of these externally controlled schools. I, I think that interdistrict charter schools, I think the intergovernmental charter schools, and I think more importantly, community-based schools, such as community schools mm-hmm. that have the wraparound services that actually address the challenges and the instability that poverty brings to the classroom, I think that is where we need to head, which is where communities have a say in what's happening. You know, what happens with these charter schools, uh, you know, like the KIPs of the world, often these are staffed by Teach for America teachers that are external to that community. As you know, in New Orleans, you've had wave after wave of two-year uh, Teach for America teachers, and then what they do is they go off and start charter schools at the age of 25. One third of all Teach for America teachers are in charter schools, and so uh, the peer-reviewed work that Carrie Kretschmar did in Louisiana showed the interaction between the Gates Foundation, uh, the Broad Foundation, uh, the Walton Foundation. Which, by the way, you know, of course, we all know that that uh, Dr. Uh, Howard's uh, BAO has received millions and millions of dollars. And you're Gates. right. And my problem with it, man, is I want more. My problem with it is <laughs> that I ain't get do? enough. <laughs> you, no, I do, man, because if I can get more, I can serve the kids that we work with so much better. So I'm out there every day. As what I did the same thing when I was a superintendent, man, I went out to the private sector to seek money. And whenever I got grants when I was a superintendent, and it came from private sector. I didn't hear nothing but praise for my ability to go out and raise funds. So, don't, but, but once again, man, I'm not. I'm not trying to switch the argument. I'm trying to make the argument that these things that you're applying over at charter schools that they've been existing in the traditional system as well. It's all. It, it all depends on your context. But but the one thing I would say, Drew, is that. I was just telling Andre, and, and maybe this would be too much to hope for, but I bet if you and I got in a room somewhere and, you know, away from the rhetoric and this and that, and tried to really focus in on what are four or five things that we actually agree on that we could work on to try to make education better for the poorest children in this country, it, it would be interesting to do because I believe that that's what you're concerned about, and I know that that's what I'm concerned about. Now, is community schools one of those yeah, but see, the interesting thing about community schools, man, is, and, and, and again, I, you know, I'm old and stuff, so y'all just have to take this in context. James Comer mm-hmm. had talked about this idea of Comer schools, that, you know, 25, 30 years ago, which now people call community schools as if it's some new thing that has arrived on the horizon, right? Anybody with any sense would support the idea of a school having wraparound services. Like one of my big concerns about the kids at our school, for example, is the lack of mental health services because of the trauma that our kids are experiencing on a regular basis. There's all kinds of services that I wish that we could bring into our schools so that we could actually serve our kids better. But the reality of it is there is no political will in this country to fund these types of programs at a level that are necessary because this country essentially don't care about poor black children. And so we, we can talk all we want, but at the end of the day, can we come together to try to figure out a way to bring resources to our children, irrespective of what kind of school they're in? Julian, is there a, a sweet spot? Is there a, a place where you believe um, folks of different education stripes can come together, um, particularly around the funding of schools. Have, have there ever been a time that you found where you could work alongside the charter um, sector to um, to lobby for more funding for all schools? 
Uh, I think my days of working with the charter sector are over. <laughs> I, I think, I think, what, but what uh, Dr. Fuller said, which is that there's no political will to properly resource schools and to pay for pre-K and to pay for smaller class sizes and to pay for AP courses and to pay for certified teachers. Uh, those are the things that when you do surveys of parents and you ask them what they want in their neighborhood public schools, that's what they tell you they want. Now, the problem has been that in wealthy areas, on the other side of the tracks, they get all of those things, and they get all of those things because we have a market-based system that allows winners and losers. And so, yes, we, that's where we agree. Now, where we diverge is what the solution is. Now, I understand Dr. Fuller's position, which is that private schools and charter schools and traditional public schools, but I believe in democratically controlled public schools. I believe that the resources of our schools should be democratically accountable in Texas, in Austin, Texas, when the school board signed a sweetheart deal with the idea charter school chain from South Texas, and the community was unhappy with that. They voted those four school board members out of office. But you see in Chicago, because it's an indirect uh, democracy and the school board has done all, I mean, they're facing layoffs again just recently in the last couple of weeks. You have to vote the mayor out to have any impact on the education system. And that's the challenge with indirect democracy. But with direct democracy, if the school boards cross you, you can go door to door and get them unelected. But with indirect democracy, it's a much more complicated process. Now, but I just want to be clear that you're, but you're talking about what most li- our listeners are, t- are um, um, see all the time. Well, maybe not here in, in New Orleans is a locally elected body. Um, but because Dr. Fuller already said th- there are levels of elected and democratic systems. It's just depending on where you are. Yeah, and and, and also, I mean, and and, and I, I agree with the ideal that Julian just laid out. My experience, however, is that many, many school board elections are in fact controlled by a relatively small number of people who actually show up and vote in school board elections. And in many instances around this country, teacher unions have an inordinate amount of control over school boards by virtue of their level of participation in school board elections. But I'm not so I'm mad let me, at let me respond to that. that. Actually, I'm not I mad at them a, about that. I got a call from a school board so. member from a large urban city right here in California. And the charter school lobby approached this school board member and said, if you support charter schools, we know that you're going on to the school board of a traditional district, but if you support charter schools, then we will help your campaign. She said, yes. Checks started showing up from all over the United States, adding up to half a million dollars. So the idea that some and and you Union, see, unions well, do the same thing, Julian. They and, do and, the same and, thing. But the thing is that we're talking about scale, okay? So they they I, do I it at a scale that's actually education. our budgets in the tens of thousands of dollars. Yeah. Yeah. But see, Dr. Fuller's budgets in the millions because Walton and all these other folks, Gates, have so you know, hey, I'm brother, from Michigan. Brother, so I, what? I believe in brother. I believe in the underdog. My lines went oh and sixteen just a couple of years ago. So, <laughs> so clearly, the money is not on my team, but that's okay, brother. The money Money, all of these millions that you talk about I have, please, please come show them to me. And the, 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 the idea that you think that I'm rolling around with millions of dollars of wild money is, is almost laughable, man. You do when get you, a when, nice Malcolm X t-shirt yeah, on. Yeah, yeah, that, that cost 1095. <laughs> you know, but, but, but what I'm saying, man, is when you start talking about who got money out here in America, and, 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 and who has a greater capacity because of control over resources to exercise control? And you're going to, you're going to start talking about it's the charter sector as compared to what you see with, with unions and other people who are protecting the traditional system? Come on, man. I mean, but, but, but see, again, the problem I'm having here is that we almost invariably end up at each other on arguments like this, which I think are not fundamental to the main thing that, we should be discussing and that we were kind of discussing in terms of how do we come together to ensure that there is real funding for all of our children who are going to school and who need not only educational services, but who need all of these other services in order for them to deal with the realities that they face. You know, and, this, and I just want to in, um, interject just quickly because there, there were t- a couple of issues in Louisiana in particular that I still don't understand why the charter – community does not work alongside the traditional um, school community and 
and both in my mind, in, in my mind, are on the wrong side of this. One is around um, suspension expulsion of of the, our babies, um, K to to, to three year olds in Louisiana. A bill comes up every year to either ban suspension and expulsion, and both sectors, including and unions, constantly um, block that legislation. And another piece is around the area of just overall funding. The, um, all students in Louisiana receive a per pupil expenditure. There's never a robust effort to really lobby for more money, and I can tell you. That there is not enough, and I, could I know from just a school operator side, and also as a parent who sends their a child to a private school, where the comparison is overwhelming in terms of the um, um, the resources one receives. So, can is that a are those two areas that we can work together on? I think so. I mean, I, it's something I would love to work on. I don't, I don't know how Julian. Julian, is about that. Are those two things. Do you, would you work alongside your your, your uh, charter colleagues to to ban suspension expulsion for the babies? Well, we've we've had good we've had good news on suspension here in California. Oh, okay, okay. Suspension's actually down three hundred thousand over the last couple of years here because California has been focusing on on uh, limiting these discretionary. Uh, um, uh, suspension. Yes, suspension. Yeah. And, and they've also in our local accountability. Uh, so in California, we have what are called local accountability plans. We've had them for three years. So it's sort of the sort of top-down Texas-style approach to accountability, focused heavily on testing, which I experienced when I worked for Rod Page in, in Houston early on, is uh, a local approach where they develop short-term and long-term plans for schools focused on low SES kids, uh, foster youth, and ELL kids. And uh, from Prop 30, there's extra money from California. So there are several places like Stockton, Oakland, Los Angeles, that are spending good sums of money from their strategic accountability plans on reducing these uh, uh, disciplinary issues using restor- various restorative justice practices. So that's actually something that, you know, if, if Louisiana is interested in the kind of things that, are, that California has been doing around this issue, we're actually having some success here. Now I have, um, as we um, wind down, I have a little activity for you guys. I want you to recommend to each other a book um, and why you would recommend reading it. And, and so I'll, I'll start with you, Dr. <laughs> Fuller. What book would you recommend Julian reading? Uh, Educational Blacks in the South, uh, 1870-1935 by Dr. James Anderson. Why is that? Because it's the clearest explanation that I've ever encountered about the ongoing uh, problem that black people have trying to get an education in America and trying to do that in a way that advances our people. And Jim took 10 years to write that book, and in my opinion, it's, it's a, a, a it's primer yeah. for anybody who wants to talk about black education. Julian, what, re- what book would you recommend to Howard? Okay, so how about I give a shout-out to Louisiana uh, native uh, Mercedes Schneider, her book, School oh, yeah. Choice, The End of Public Education. I'd, I'd recommend he Why? It. Why is that? Well, because I think it lays out sort of the uh, the information and the data about how school choice and our conversations about school choice have to go beyond sort of the very simple political framing that it's about parent choice. It goes into the money behind the choice, the, the purpose of our education system, the democratic approaches to education. So I, I think it's a great book that sort of would give him a different perspective, probably not the perspective that he hears uh, from the people he usually conversates with. Well, first of all, Julian, with all due respect, brother, you don't know who I usually conversate with. <laughs> so, I mean, I, I, don't, I don't think you ought to say that because you don't know me like that. And so I actually conversate with a, with a lot of people that you would be surprised that I conversate with. So I would never say that to you and assume that, you know, you only talk to certain people and you shouldn't assume that about me. You know, and that is an interesting thing because I, I have to say that most of the people involved in this space I talk to pretty frequently either, you know, electronically um, and we maintain a level of communication um, but, you know, and this is where I will go back to. For me, I still don't see power um, being 
um, dis- distilled to the people who need it most. And and that's why I think um, my efforts are going to be um, directed in the next um, few years. So I think we've come to a close for another wonderful edition of Free College. I want to thank my guest, Julian Vasquez Helig, professor at the good Sacramento State, and Dr. Howard Fuller for the transformation of learning. Thanks, gentlemen, for being here. It's good to see you. Good to talk to you, Julian. Take it easy. Bye bye. Till next week, where education is not preparation for life, education is life itself. Peace out.